So I teach teenagers. At face value, that might come across as very oxymoronic. How does one teach teenagers? They are infamous for being ungovernable, and they certainly aren't interested in reading and learning and all those wonderful things we want them to be. So I've been working with teenagers for a few years now, and I'm realizing that I'm probably learning more from them than actually teaching. Unless one parents teenagers, I wonder how many adults consider the prospect of learning from teenagers. Because one never knows what the questions through interactions with teenagers can teach us about ourselves and about the world around us. However, this is all quite relative because I could learn the exact same lessons from any group of people through different interactions. So in highlighting teenagers, I may come across as ageist, but also run the risk of glorifying the youth at a time where aging is seen as threatening. But I think that's a conversation for another day. So what exactly have I learned from teenagers? The idea of being a teenager was actually invented. The word teenager hasn't always existed in the English language. So by giving birth to the word teenager, we've actually given birth to a group of people with their own idiosyncrasies, their own fashions, own trends, and ways of being in the world, a new way of being in the world. There's an entire history of what it means to be a teenager. So some sources posit that it first came up in the 1940s in the United States, when Life magazine had a photo essay and they spoke about the teen age. It was spelled teen with a hyphen age. Others suggest it was the 1800s is where it all began in industrializing societies. And we all know that Socrates was charged with heresy and corrupting the minds of the youth. So this kind of suggests that the idea of being young and impressionable has always been with us in, as human beings. I'm Tosa, and in this Tosa, we don't actually have the equivalent of teenager. We have the word ulucha. Ulucha has the root word, which means new. But ulucha is also a very generous definition of what it means to be young. So it covers from 13 to about roughly 35. Whereas teenager seems to be exclusively for people between the ages 13 and 18 who just happen to be miniature adults who can blame any deviance in their behavior on the hormones coursing through their body. <laughs> the second thing I've learned about teenagers is that they're quite ambivalent about school. It seems to be a necessary evil, and for others, an evil full stop. Many teenagers morph into a different breed once they come into my classroom. And many parents probably wouldn't be able to recognize their little angels when they're in my classroom. But this tells us that for many teenagers, schools are a place where they can regale against the system rather than bringing their true selves into the classroom, whatever true self might be for a teenager. So most teenagers refer to school as modern concentration camps or jail. I've even heard factories. We have this idea that classrooms are a space where teachers are in control and we are inspiring the minds of the youth. Now on a good day, this can happen. On a not so good day, when my patience is tested and my kids aren't interested in learning about parts of speech and I have to pass the time by without seeing like a glorified nanny, this is when the real things happen. So on any given day, I often have a question such as, ma'am, is this going to be an exam? Is this going to be for marks? Because our kids have been conditioned into this idea that things are only important and learning is only important when it's for exams. Or my favorite, ma'am, why do I need a matric? The president doesn't have a matric, so why do I need a matric? That's often the most trickiest one to consider because whatever the case may be, our kids are definitely growing up in a different time to the one that their president was growing up in. But I'm sure we know that in South Africa, the messages that we get about education is that education is completely irrelevant and people aren't being prepared enough to go into university or it's failing our children because, as we've seen in South Africa, many young people can't read and write at a certain level. Now, these messages may be true, but they're also very dangerous because by the time a teenager comes into my classroom, they've been conditioned that they're wasting their time. 
These messages are also very dangerous for a teacher who's working very hard and a great duress, trying to make learning very relevant to teenagers in very difficult conditions. Another thing that I've learned from teenagers are the complications about race and gender. So I teach a group of people who've been referred to as the millennials in the global discourse. In South Africa, we call them the born freeze. Or as one of my grade 11 students wrote in an essay, she's part of the best you can be generation. So these are the people born post-1994, after the democratic elections, and so know nothing about apartheid. They are going to save us from ourselves and our racist ways and usher us into a post-sexist, post-racist society. Because every time apartheid comes up, they roll their eyes and start talking to the person sitting next to them. Or so we'd like to think. I've been very shocked and surprised by the number of times I've heard racist and sexist comments in my classroom. Often when I probe the students, um, I'm told, well ma'am, it's just a joke. Okay, so you can apply humor to something when you're trying to appreciate each other's differences. But the truth remains is that those ideas are still there. And we've got to ask ourselves, where do those ideas come from? So often when you probe and you ask, where did that come from? They're like, well, I just like hanging out with people who look, think, smell, sound like me. I'm not really interested in anybody else because it's just easier. And often this is a very dangerous territory to go through with kids because we don't want to give them our baggage. But it's inevitable. And often it's just a matter of saying, well, even though we want to change the language of sexism and gender and racism, the ideas still remain because these people are being brought up with people who have these ideas in their homes and in their communities. So what are we doing this for? This was a question one of my grade nine boys asked me after exams last year. I figured he didn't like the idea of exams and quite honestly, who does? So his simple question led me to consider what are we doing this for? What are we doing in high schools and what are we teaching high school kids about what success means? Right now, success means passing an exam, it means getting the good grades, it means passing a test. Success is about choosing subjects when you're 15 and they'll influence your degree when you're 18 or the job or the college that you'll probably go to in the future. Success is about the future and not who we want our teenagers to be right now. And if we look at the examples of what a success is, what do teenagers have to play with? Miley Cyrus, Justin Bieber, Rihanna, Julius Malema? People who haven't necessarily ticked the boxes of what we consider as adults as successful. So this begs the question of how are we going to give our teenagers meaningful examples of what it means to be successful? How do we change the language of success from one of bling and riches to something that is more meaningful for them to grasp. I hope you've realized that I have a very middle class understanding of what it means to be a teenager. We assume that teenagers have resources available to them that will make them quintessential teenagers according to what we see mostly on American TV. But there is more than one narrative of what it means to be a teenager today. What about teenagers who are raising children? What about teenagers who are raising their own siblings? Or teenagers who are in jail? Or teenagers who can't afford to be in school and have to support families? What is their experience of being a teenager and where did they find a space in the world? Now it's easy to generalize about teenagers because they are just one big blob, of homogenous group of pimples, angst and hormones. <laughs> But the truth is, the talkative rascal who can't sit down in my grade nine class is a teenager the same way the quiet kid who sits at the back and just goes about their work is also a teenager. And in trying not to generalize, I think we need to ask ourselves, as if you're a parent or a teacher or you're working with young people, what is this about? We're living in a completely different era and what are we going to teach our kids about a time where we have no idea where we're going and neither do they? And in trying not to generalize, I've been told that not all teenagers are catching on nonsense, as my grade aides tried to say. Not everyone is doing what they shouldn't be doing. But as one of my grade 10 boys told me recently, boys will never be able to think with their brains.